everyone, and welcome to the Sabbath School Study. <laughs> I'm your host, Jamal Thomas, and of course, it's always a good time to be here with you, all of my friends. And of course, I have with me in the studio a good friend of mine uh, and yours by now. Uh, I'm just going to let him say his name for you. Hi, I'm Andre Springer, and it's good to have you. All right, awesome. And of course, we are again digging deep into the Word of God under the caption, The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. This week, we are at study number 12 already. It's been 12 weeks. Man, time sure goes quickly when you're having fun in the Word of God. And this week, we are actually doing a special study under the caption, Covenant Faith. I am going to pray to open and then... We are going to dive deep into this, uh, this today's study. Let's just bow our heads together as we ask God to bless us and to help us to understand what we're reading. Let's bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here and to study your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit will really dwell with us today and help us to understand the things that we read. And most of all, Help us to commit our hearts to you because these things are true and they are faithful and they are for our benefit. So thank you for this promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, um, Andre, so do you think, uh, you, I'm going to read the memory text and uh, I, there's a special story that we have here about Odysseus. I'm going to let you introduce this story for us. But our memory text is taken from Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. A very popular one. I'm going to read it here for you. And it says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. So what is this? Um, how, and that, how can we use the story of Odysseus to uh, introduce this topic of covenant faith uh, that we have here? Tell us, tell us the story. Well, the story is basically about a warrior who had done great exploits for his people, but on his way home on the ship, he faced a lot of challenges. But eventually, you know, I'm just giving you the short version. Eventually, he was allowed to go home because the gods had thought that he had paid his vows or paid his dues, really, in, his, in them torturing him, so to speak. Those are my words. And it gives us the idea that the gods require works in order for us to be able to come into their presence or to be accepted by them. And this is completely contrary to what we are taught by the Judeo-Christian religion. That is true. That is so true. Uh, I'm so glad that, that God doesn't require us to go on some long journey mm -hmm. in order to be worthy to receive of his promises. Yes. He just tells us to come and receive that which he has already paid for by faith, and then we can have it. In fact, uh, well, you know, I guess it's a good time to reflect on Calvary. And some of the things that we have here uh, presented before us today, we're going to talk about it. Uh, so when, you, when we hear about Calvary, first and foremost, what is it that comes to our minds? I, I know for me, the cross comes to my mind. Uh, and, and of course, the importance of the cross is that Jesus died for our sins. But what other reflections can, I mean, if we take think about the, the story, we know that um, Odysseus, he accomplished these many wonderful tasks, you know. Uh, he was a great warrior. He had reasons to brag and to bro boast and to be proud. He was a great warrior. But I mean, when we look at the cross and when we stand in the shadow of the cross, what, what, do we have anything to be proud about, uh, uh, Andre? No, we don't have anything. And the thing about the cross is the cross has to do with acceptance and acceptance of humanity. Now, as I was thinking about it in some section. I ask myself, what is so fascinating about the sacrifice, especially in the context of the ancient Near East? And it really isn't anything fascinating because they had their sacrifices. 
They even sacrifice their children in order to appease the God. Mm -hmm. But as in the ancient Near East, so it is with all cultures that practice religion by works. They all require that there is a, some kind of sacrifice in order for you to come in the presence of the gods or the God or to be accepted by the gods. All religions do this. But there's only one religion, the Judeo-Christian religion, that doesn't require man to make the sacrifice, but require God to make the sacrifice. So in order for us to come into the presence of God, God made the sacrifice. And if you think about it, this really put everybody on an even keel. Because, Jamal, I don't know if you understand it, but if salvation was ever by works, I don't, even if it were by works, I don't even think I would have made it. Me for sure. <laughs> Not me. Because <laughs> I don't have, first of all, I don't have the means. I might be the wrong color. This poor man cried. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Lord had to deliver me. Yeah, and so many people would have been excluded. And if you just think about that concept alone, those persons in the ancient Near East, even in, in the popular religions that we have today, they do not find rest. They do not find peace. They always have to do something, whether it is um, Hail Marys, uh, giving food to the gods, whatever it is, there is always this need for acceptance. And whatever they give, they never feel it is enough because they don't get what they're looking for. That's why those people used to sacrifice their sons and daughters. Yeah. Because they never felt that they got it. I, you know, w one thing that really stood, came to mind when you were talking just now is that, you know, um, in, and it is true that even today in some religions, uh, people make offerings to, to their gods. But what, what is so, and I, I, want, I don't want to use the word strange here, but what is so impressive about uh, the way that our salvation was paid for is that the creator himself, God himself, was, was willing to sacrifice of his own life for us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and there's, there's something here to me that stands out because it tells me that I don't have anything to be proud about when it mm. comes to uh, the price for my salvation and how even it stands out to me that it has to be by faith alone. Because if it required, if my sin required that God himself should die, then it means that I could never pay for it. Like, I don't have enough money, all the world, money in the world. And, and I've, I believe there are songs that say stuff like that too, you know? All the money in the world couldn't pay for my salvation. And when you really sit and think about it, you know, Andre, I, I mean, I'm really humbled by that because it means that God plays so much value on our lives, and it, and it tells me that he must have been a God of love too, but I don't know if you have. Yeah, the extreme love, because he want, God has this desire that everybody be saved. You can try to put your head around it, because it's, it's something that we naturally don't have. Um, the, the very moment that someone messes up, we have, uh, especially when you get on your nerves, we want to get rid of them, dismiss them, but God, is, God isn't like that. And the only requirement that God has for salvation, and people need to hear this, the only requirement God has for salvation is faith. Amen. That you possess faith, and faith is a noun. It isn't even, it isn't even a verb. That you possess faith in his son. And as long as you possess that faith in his son, God accredits to you something that is not yours. So, so the very idea that salvation is based on faith puts all of us on a level playing field. And it says, Jamal, the blind, the sighted, the rich, the poor, the free, the born, the, the black, male, the, the female, um, the learned, the ignorant, mm -hmm. anybody, Jamal, everyone, everyone. could possess faith. All right. It doesn't matter where you come from, where you're going, who you are. Anybody, even a little child, three years old, can possess faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's, that's how profound salvation is and how God's intention that everybody be saved. I love that. I love that so much. And it, it takes me into the, the next aspect of our teaching um, that, that says to us the covenant is sacrifice. Because uh, first Peter 1 18 and 19 says this you know um 
you you know that you were ransomed from the futile from the futile ways inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or or spot. I, I I'm reminded um, in Paul's writings that he says, um, you know, he doesn't want to glory in anything yeah. except the cross of Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, and I can kind of see why in, in this verse here, which Peter wrote, why he would say something like that, because this really is the believer's most prized possession, as it, it were. Is. I mean, this is what, what, what better thing do we have really to, to I mean, I got good grades in school, right, Andre? But I mean, grades, like nobody, it, it doesn't even matter if you can't work, you know? Right. I mean, without good health and all these things can fail you. But one thing that will never fail is the blood of Jesus. And so talk to me a little bit more about why, I mean, the covenant and his sacrifice. What, what does it mean for us? I, there was some stuff in here, too, about the substitutionary atonement and his voluntary death on Calvary. I'm, yeah. I, I, talk to me about this, this teaching. Well, the sacrifice, we were here talking about it earlier. The it's not just a sacrifice, but we're talking about the quality of the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Is that what um, Peter compares it with? He says gold and silver and such things that are perishable. Gold and silver are perishable. That's one of the most enduring yeah, substances the, on the earth. That that speaks to you about the quality about the sacrifice that was paid for our ransom. And that, this tells us that the only person that could have paid our ransom could have been God himself because he had to be equal with God. I mean, mm-hmm. God's law was broken and someone who was equal with God had to be able to do that. Because think about it, Adam, after he sinned, Adam and Eve, they needed to remain in the presence of God. How did God do that? God took the, the clothing that they were wearing, fig leaves, and God gave them something that was endurable yeah. at that time, yeah. animal skin. Yeah. It's the same thing with Christ. Uh, in order for us to come into God's presence, we have to have his righteousness. We can have the righteousness of angels. That is not equal with God. No. We, I can't have your righteousness, Juma. We have to have God's own righteousness, his yeah. holiness, in order to come into his presence. And that's what we have, his blood. I mean, we, we talk about the, the quality of his blood is able to cover everybody. You know, and I think that, I think that, you know, some people have a difficulty, some of our brethren uh, have a difficulty and I used to have a difficulty to understand, like, why did it have to be Jesus as we identified him as the creator, you know? Um, but I'm, I'm understanding, especially through this study and studies just like these, that it was because the moral law of God was broken. And that represents his character. And so the eternal law was broken. And so something of equal value had to be sacrificed in order to a piece yeah, to right. satisfy the requirements of that broken law. So it had to be... It had to be the son. It had to be the son, you know? And so what else? What else can we say? Um, there, as you said, and I like this one, n- no mortal being could suffice to, to pay for that which was broken, if, if being eternal, and that yeah. was the law. And so what, what is Romans? I just want to read this verse here, one of my favorite ones. I can't let this one go by. Um, what is this one? Um, Romans 6, 23. 23. You have it there? You want to read it for me? This is the New American Standard Bible. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, I love it so much. But let's take this one step further. Uh, because we heard about the free gift, if we receive the free gift. And let me just take one minute to give a plug here for Jesus. So look, listen, that free gift is still available to you today. Isn't that right, Andre? Yes, it is. If anybody, anyone, remember, I remember saying last week that my ability to sin does n- will never exceed Christ's ability to represent me before the Father. Yes, that's true. And But you have to accept his free gift. So if you haven't already, today is your day. Accept Jesus. Accept his sacrifice on the cross on your behalf so that he can represent for you 
and help you to live a life that is pleasing in his sight. And before you go on, let me just give you a quick analogy on how important it is that someone of Jesus' stature could only do this. I remember one time I wanted to sell a painting to a woman. And I went and she liked the painting. And I tell her, uh, such and such amount. She said, no. I said, why not? She said, said, but you know it's a good quote. She said, yeah, but you don't got a name. No. (laughs) You don't got a name. So you see, it was not the painting itself. It was my name. So in order for A to be, she to be able to pay that price, I had to have a recognizable name. So it, it speaks about the, the person. I mean, if you are God, um, your blood. So the value of the law, the, yeah, because, the, because it was Christ, God's name that was yeah. at stake. Yeah, I got you. It wasn't mine. So the value was taken because it was God's law that was broken. Beautiful. And so this is why it's important. That's why texts like Genesis 15 verse 6 becomes so important. And this is what we're talking about here now is faith. And it says, Genesis 15 verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's Abraham. Abraham believed in the Lord. And he, God, counted it to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, verse 6. The first thing that I want to say about this one here is that it it shows me that justification by faith came long before the New Testament. It seems like God was interested in justifying sinful men by their faith long before it happened in the Old Testament. And, And if I remember correctly, when God was saying this about Abraham, it was even before he was circumcised. I mean, even before he was circumcised, let's take a minute and take that in. Uh, What it says to me is that God is interested. He clearly was interested in redeeming all men. And he was showing that he had the power and the right to do it for those who who were represented by that, that physical marking of circumcision. And even if you didn't have that physical marking, but I just, I, that one excited me this week. But what else can we learn about the faith of Abraham? Well, in, in this section, the quarterly is looking at, uh, well, the, le- the study guide is looking at uh, imputed righteousness. Uh, so when Abraham believed in the Lord, the Bible says he was accounted, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Some, some Bibles may say reckon. The word there is, uh, the theological term is imputed, which is a transfer where people are um, given something that they don't deserve. So Abraham, on account on his faith in God, was treated as righteous, even though he was not. So you see, so it isn't that God necessarily gave him something, but there was a transfer. And so when God, when the Bible says, it was accounted to him for righteousness instead of God seeing Abraham's or Abraham's righteousness, he saw Christ's righteousness. The word here so could be also credited, which we were talking about earlier, could mean to pay forward or something. There was something there already for the sinner. And as long as the sinner used the key of faith, he could access it. Yes. And that's exactly what Abraham did. Righteousness was there because Christ would die on the sinner's behalf. All he needed to do was to receive it by faith. And that's what we do. That we just receive God's, Christ's righteousness as long as we accept um, Jesus Christ. Man, this, is, this is a lot to give us. Um, it, it's a lot to give us hope in a world like today. Because I know a lot, I know people are struggling right now. A lot of people can't pay their bills properly. You know, they, they, get, they have to think long and hard about putting gas in their cars. But to think that God has, al- has already credit, credit is available. Yes, it is available. <laughs> the righteousness is available. Available. And all we have to do is believe, have faith, and Ah, and ask Jesus to come into our hearts and he brings righteousness. Mm -hmm. He brings it. I mean, when you think about it, if we really have to try to work our way to the standard of righteousness that God requires of us, we could never make it. And this is why I love this idea of the imputation of righteousness so much. Because even if we look at the life of 
um, Abraham. And I do think that I remember in that story, you know, he, he kind of messed up a little bit more, didn't he? Yes. I mean, he was always messing up. And that is why he needed imputed righteousness. So that even though he's messing up, all God is seeing is Christ. Mm -hmm. because, because Christ is the one who had this perfect obedience right. to render. And he had the perfect righteousness because he kept the law perfectly. No, no. Uh, and again, I want to underscore this, and we say this a lot. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that Abraham was free to do whatever he wanted. You know, that's right, right, Andre? That's exactly correct. He <laughs> wasn't free to do what he wanted. As a matter of fact, you can even go on to say it because he he received that confirmation that God had declared him to be righteous. We can see him going on in his life to try to make sure that he pleases God, even though he misses the mark right. sometimes. That's his right. life is one in which he's trying, he's actively trying to please God. So when God has declared us to be righteous, that is our attitude. We, we see our best. We see in us Christ, and we seek our best to live up to that standard. And even if we fail, we know that what God sees, he doesn't see me, he doesn't see my imperfections. He just sees Christ because that imputed righteousness declares me righteous. Exactly. It declares me righteous. That's correct. I, I don't know. If you, if you don't understand everything that he was saying, and I believe by God's grace, you understand. I, I just want to say to you that this is God is giving you the opportunity to mature into the height and depth yes. and love and love the stature of full measure of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I wish we had more time in our <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. But, you know, we, we take what we have and we, and we leave the rest with God, you know? And so this idea of imputed righteousness, uh, there's just one further step that I want to go here. Um, that There's just one thing I want to remind us all, and that is God is accounting the sinner as righteous, although the individual is actually unrighteous. And you said this just now, right? Yes. Um, but this one is is kind of mind blowing, and I I love it. I mean, it gives us a measure of certainty about our salvation in Christ. I mean, and it is not a situation that we are falling out of this covenant relationship every time that we sin. No, we stay committed to God. He in, He has imputed His righteousness, and it gives us the opportunity to get right with God, yes. you know, and to mature into the, the, the full measure of Jesus Christ, the, the kind of Christian that would make God proud, you know. And I, I love this because it is, it's almost like, like God is, you really have to decide you don't want to be in this covenant relationship with Jesus in order to fail. Yeah, because you see, this is, Imputed righteousness and then there's imparted righteousness, and both of them are works or acts of Christ in order to make us like God. Imputed righteousness makes us like Christ, even though we are not, and the imparted righteousness is the power that is given to us daily to live up to that standard. Yep. So, there's a standard God has that He wants us to live to, and it is the imparted righteousness that gives us that ability each day but if we if we look at this imputed righteousness in more depth as it's done in, in main section we can see that every time that hebrew word is used someone well not every time but in the context of um something being imputed someone was um spoken of being something that they were not or not um and that is exactly how and uh, who we are how could god i mean Jamal, this just says to me that God at every step is trying to guarantee my salvation. My salvation. How can God declare me to be righteous? How can he do that? Only on the only on the blood of Christ. I mean, Jesus. I know, yeah. and I know if there's one boy that knows I am righteous is me. <laughs> I know myself too, bro. Yeah, I mean, but God says it. Yeah. And and this is where faith comes in. It, because for the Christian, this is one of the hardest things to believe. You know yourself. But but God says, if you believe in Christ by faith, I don't care how you know yourself. Let's see the imputed righteousness. That is what I yeah. see. And this is one of the hardest things for a Christian. And sometimes this is why we don't move on. Because we know ourselves. We know the foolishness that we do. And we just allow the foolishness that we do 
to sink into our brains that we can't come to God. We're not good enough. God says, no, come. It is Christ's righteousness. Yep. Believe in Christ's righteousness. Yeah. Yep. Man, I listen. I there is just one more step I I need us to to go to because I know I and there's so many we interact with our Christian brethren daily, you know. And I I want people to thrive and to prosper in their Christianity today. So is it a situation like like Odysseus where we have to to wrestle? and then suffer for a long time before we start to receive of these blessings and the promises that he has promised us? Or can we start living uh, in the context of his promises now? Take, give me at least one of these promises in one minute, Andre, uh, and that we can, if, if we can receive it, that we can receive now, that will make us smile. Matthew eleven thirty, right here in the study guide talks about taking the yoke of Christ upon you. One of the greatest feelings uh, about Christianity is knowing that your burdens have been lifted. Even though you're story. living into that reality, you know they've been lifted, Jamal. I want to read this one in Matthew 11.30. Yeah, Matthew 11.30. All right. This is for somebody out there. Here it goes. For my yoke is easy mm-hmm. and my burden is light. Somebody out there today listening and and hearing um, needed to hear that Christ, you you take the you take his yoke, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. A yoke and a burden were not meant to be things that were easy or light, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf, it becomes easy and it becomes light. I wish we had more time to to unpack this, but I'm. I, all that we can do now, my friends, uh, I'm going to let Andre encourage you and then I'm going to let him pray. And then I'm going to to give you your take us out and we'll meet you here again next week, same time and same place. Listen, Thanks. brethren, listen, sisters, God requires one thing of you and that is that you possess faith in Jesus Christ. As long as you do that, God is going to guarantee your salvation. He's going to give you the power to live for him all your mistakes all the things that you do that come short god says if you believe in jesus christ he's going to make up for them just believe he's going to give you the power to obey and that is all god requires of you so i'm just going to ask you wherever you are to bow your heads and we're going to pray for you heavenly father we give you thanks for your blessings upon us. We give you thanks for the study. We give you thanks for all those who are listening, who are struggling, as all of us have struggled at some point in time. I pray the Lord that you will bless them. Continue to reassure them through your word that no matter what they do, that they can't work themselves out of your hands unless it is by their choice. Help them to know that it is by faith and faith alone that they are accepted in the beloved. You will give them the power to overcome. All they have to do is believe. Bless them, Lord. Bless us every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this has been our program for this week. My name is Jamal Thomas, and I am encouraging you all to study to show yourselves approved unto God. Until next time.